Hello, we are here today with Pablo no. Romero Fresco, Honorary Professor of Translation and Filmmaking at the University of Roehampton in London, and also Ramon y Cajal Granholder at the University of Lille. Welcome. Thank you for having us today. It's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, Professor Fresco, your latest publication, subtitled Through Speech Recognition, Free Speaking, dealt with a very specialized subject that was at the time pioneering. What is Free Speaking? Free Speaking is a type of live subtitle that is subtitles that are produced um, for content that is live. Um, and Free Speaking is just one of the methods. Um, where, through which you can produce those subtitles. So there are other methods, like for example, stenography, that are still used in countries like the United States or Canada. But re-speaking is perhaps now the prevailing method, so the most common method um, used to produce subtitles um, for live content that are, in theory, intended for um, audiences that have um, hearing loss. What we know now is that a great deal of the an important part of the audience that are watching those subtitles are not necessarily deaf or they don't necessarily have a hearing loss so it's a wider um, audience than than the one we have thought about but this is basically it so free speaking is this method whereby we can produce live subtitles um, and it's based on speech recognition so the uh, method consists of having um, a re-speaker or a live subtitler listen to the original soundtrack of a live program, re-speaking it, by which we mean either repeating it or rephrasing it, adding punctuation marks um, to a speech recognition software that shows the uh, live subtitles on the screen with the minimum possible delay. So it's a um, process, if you like, of intralingual live, intralingual simultaneous interpreting, adding punctuation marks, and adding also certain features that are needed for those subtitles to, to be accessible for people with hearing loss, such as, for example, um, content to do with non-verbal components, such as sound, and certainly the identification of the speakers. Mm -hmm. So I hope that makes sense. Then uh, a re-speaker is an interpreter, a subtitle, a subtitle, sorry, both at the same time? That's, that's a very difficult question. Um, the process of what they do is uh, simultaneous interpreting, normally, in, in the same language, so intralingual simultaneous interpreting, that's the process of what they do. Um, as I say, they also add punctuation marks and they add certain kind of uh, description of sounds or, or identification of speakers and all they are doing, which is that process, they are um, saying that to a speech recognition software. So that's the second kind of part of the team. They have to work alongside this speech recognition software with the uh, success and the errors of that software. Uh, and only once their intralingual uh, simultaneous interpreting has gone through the software, then it's shown to the viewers as subtitles. So I would say the process is interpreting or simultaneous interpreting, and the result are, are subtitles. So re-speaking could be seen as a combination of three different components. The first one would be simultaneous interpreting, in this case intralingual simultaneous interpreting with the addition of punctuation marks and some features for the... Um, for people with hearing loss. Then the second aspect would be subtitling, which is the result of, of what you're doing. And the third one would be speech recognition. So if we talk about, if we, if we focus on it from a chronological point of view, first the re-speaker does the intralingual simultaneous interpreting, then it goes through speech recognition software, which is one more element in the team, if you like. So what you say will have to be um, recognized by the software, and then that could bring about some issues errors or not. And finally, what the viewers see on their screens are subtitles, um, which you don't necessarily need to know that they have been produced through speech recognition. Mm -hmm. So um, I think basically the process is simultaneous interpreting, the result is subtitling, um, and then it's a question of how you want to look at it. Do you want to look at it from the point of view of the result or from the point of view of the process? So those three components are very important because they also determine how you train re-speakers. Um, you have to equip them with simultaneous interpreting skills, even though it's going to be intralingual, but still um, they need to have um, the skills that are needed to um, split their attention, to be able to speak as they listen. Um, so that those, those aspects are very important. Then you also have to provide them with subtitling skills, 
because that's what they're going to be producing and in many ways they're going to be thinking about uh, to some extent segmentation and uh, the layout of the subtitles and then you also have to provide them with speech recognition skills because that's the tool they're going to be using um, and therefore they need to be very familiar with how speech recognition works. So how is it normally done? Uh, is it an individual work where the speaker does it all or many people contribute to this process? Well, it's difficult again to answer that question because um, re-speaking started with a need which was the need to provide live subtitles for people with hearing loss. Um, there was also a tool which was speech recognition, but there was no set way or uh, precise guidelines as to how this could be done. So everyone went about it uh, as best as they could, but with a great deal of freedom which determine uh, or which can explain why the practices are so different now. Um, there was no um, very specific guidelines as to how to go about the process. So in some countries, like the UK, for example, you have one re speaker um, who does the live simultaneous interpreting into the same language, etc. Uh, once the subtitles are shown on the screen, then if there are errors, the live subtitler will try and correct those that he or she thinks need correcting. Um, that means that there is minimum delay, if you like, but also perhaps more errors, unless uh, re speaking is done really well. Um, but sometimes the errors are not down to the re speaker, they could be down to the speech recognition software. In other countries, um, this kind of um, relationship or uh, trade off between errors and delay um, is focused in a, from a different point of view. So, in France, for example, the priority is not to minimize the delay, but to actually minimize the errors. That means um, every effort is made to correct errors before the words are shown on screen. So the re-speaking team is made up of three, sometimes four people, where you have one re-speaker, um, then you have a corrector who corrects potential mistakes before they are shown to the audience, and you even have a whisperer, as they call it, who is somebody who will be whispering potential corrections to the corrector before um, the subtitles are shown on the screen. That means that you minimize the number of errors, but at the same time, you obviously increase delay. Um, so the practices differ uh, depending on where the focus and the priorities are set. Mm -hmm. And what about the feedback from the users themselves? In a recent publication edited by you in 2015 called The Reception of Subtitles for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing in Europe, you studied several cases around well, uh, Poland, UK, Italy, Spain, etc. Why are these reception studies relevant and important? Well, um, they're very important because I think that um, for a long time we've been focusing, I mean, if we think about audiovisual translation and, and how it comes from translation studies, for a long time we've been focusing on the process, that is to explain, describe and analyze, if you like, from a descriptive point of view, um, what's, what translation is like, what subtitling, what dubbing is like, by looking at um, corpora, for example, which, is, which has been very useful. But I think that by now, and especially in media accessibility, which is very focused on, on a service that you provide for the users, it's very important to hear the user's point of view, um, but also to see what they see and to find out what they think, um, even to learn how they process audiovisual media. And we can only do that, or one of the best ways to do that is to conduct reception studies. Um, so if we think about reception studies, um, I guess we can divide them in, in different ways or different types of reception studies. We can think about the preferences of the users and therefore um, that's something that we, you can cover with questionnaires so we find out what they think, what their views are about a particular type of accessibility or a particular approach to accessibility. Then we can also um, focus on their comprehension. Um, again, you can have comprehension tests or questionnaires where you find out the extent to which um, the viewers have understood the content, and this could be, of course, verbal or visual content. Um, so we could be looking at the subtitles or at the images or both. And finally, you could um, also think about physiological or even cognitive uh, types of reception studies. Um, and then they ha that we have different tools to measure that. So one of the ones that we have used in, in this book is eye tracking, which basically 
tells us what the viewers are looking at as they are watching audiovisual media. Um, that has been tremendously useful for us because um, although there are different theories according to which not only are we looking at what they're looking at, but also we have an insight in what, into what they think. Even if we don't agree with that, at least um, we know exactly where their eyes are. Um, and this is something that's been triggered by, for example, our use of subtitles, and that's very important. Um, it helps us understand, of course, much more what the audience, how the audience behave when they're looking at audiovisual media, in this case with subtitles, but also for a subtitler or for a subtitling um, scholar, it also helps us um, take responsibility for the change of behavior that subtitles are causing um, on the audience. And I think it just helps us understand a little bit better what it's like to watch, for example, in this case, subtitled audiovisual media. Um, if you couple that with comprehension questions and with preference questionnaires, then we have, um, I think, more thorough, wider, uh, fuller picture of the user experience and that can help, that can feed into guidelines later on as well. So not only do we have an expert's opinion on what should the subtitles should be like and mm -hmm. what features they should have, and, but guidelines can also be informed by um, the experience of the users. So in the future, how do you see accessibility on the whole being systematized and conventionalized uh, norms being derived from it? I think um, then there are different issues. I think we have moved forward. There's been massive leaps over the past years. And there are at least three, four, five issues that, that are important. One would be to look back at what's been done um, and to make sure that we take stock of everything that's been done across the globe. So for example, the, early, the very early studies on accessibility that were done in the US in the 70s, um, at least eight PhD theses on, on subtitling for the deaf and hard of hearing that had wonderful user reception studies, um, because they are older, because they are uh, set in the US, they have been kind of forgotten here in Europe. So bridging the gap between the old and the new and between the US and Europe is particularly important at this stage so that we know exactly what's been done um, and we take it on board. So that's one of the things. For that to happen, I think we need um, an effort to centralize uh, information about media accessibility. Um, if we consider that everything started around about the late 70s. We're talking 40, almost 50 years um, of research, and that's already too much to be scattered um, and not kind of centralized and channeled. So I think we need efforts to centralize the information so that we can all know what's been done and we don't reinvent the wheel. For that, we have been working on this initiative called MAP, which is a media accessibility platform that attempts to uh, host the information about media accessibility that's been spread around the world with regard to research, training, professional practice and legislation. Uh, whether this is the initiative or there, there are others, I think it's just important to, to have that. That's, that's one of the aspects that I think is important. Another one is to um, keep working with the users um, and to make sure that there is real impact behind or after uh, those type of research studies. Uh, so that it's not just a matter of, okay, we have conducted a reception study and that's published in an academic journal, but actually, how does that make a difference to society? And for that, I think it's particularly important to have on board not just academics, but also regulators, access service providers, um, broadcasters, and of course, user associations that can use the findings that we have and eventually uh, have them uh, included in the guidelines and then filter through to the users as new practices. So if we find out that subtitles are better, um, live subtitles are better in blocks than scrolling, then this shouldn't just be um, sitting in an academic journal. It should be, it should be at least, there should be an effort to make that uh, or to help that trigger a change. And basically at the end of the day, to watch a TV where the subtitles have been replaced for block subtitles as opposed to scrolling. I think that's one of the important aspects. It's difficult, but, but uh, there are um, mechanisms through which that could be done. I think we need to get out of our comfort zones as academics and, and push for that kind of social change, if you like. And another aspect that I think is important is that I think accessibility has, has been kind of growing out of, of the mold in which we have um, placed it. 
um, we focused uh, on the on viewers with sensory impairments. We focused on blind people, on deaf people, or people with hearing loss. But we have found out that SDH, subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing, are actually being seen by so many more people. So I wonder whether the terms that we have been using are able, and I really doubt that they are, are able to comprehend the magnitude, the, the scope of the really wide audience that we are referring to. So maybe we should rethink that and we should think about media accessibility as encompassing uh, as wide a viewership as, for example, audiovisual translation. Um, so that's one of the things. And I think that's important because otherwise we're going to be running into difficulties if we have live interlingual subtitles, say live respoken subtitles. Is this accessibility? Because, well, we're no longer just focusing on viewers with hearing loss. If the live content is translated live into another language, then we're going to have in the same room people with hearing loss and people who don't have a hearing loss but are just foreign speakers. Um, so that's fantastic, but then we should cater for that. Um, should we, you know, what's the compromise between uh, having a subtitles that need to include um, aspects for b viewers with hearing loss when in the same room um, that is going to be servicing um, foreign viewers as well. So I think we should be thinking more widely and it's in our interest because um, the service is actually going to be useful for so many more people that I think is going to be able, we're going to be able to push producers and people with uh, power in the media world to be able to think of media accessibility as something that is not just um, constrained to a certain type of population, but something that is very mainstream. And that's, for me, that's the way, because I think we've been, um, we've become very visible in translation studies. Uh, and if you think of media accessibility, it has become very visible in audiovisual translation, but we're still not as visible as we should be in certain industries, like the film industry, for example, the media industry. Um, and this is, I think, because of a misconception that our viewership, our audience, is just a small audience. Important as it may be, small audience. I think that's, that's no longer the case. Um, so once we actually push for that, once people realize that there is even money in here because there's so much, there's, so, there's such a wide viewership, then we should start thinking about integrating accessibility from the beginning of the production. Um, because it makes no for me at least, I mean, it's a very subjective point of view, but we've got used to um, having accessibility or audiovisual translation as, a, as an add-on at the end of a product. But why should this be like that? I mean, these days, uh, when an architect is planning a, a building, um, I doubt they'll be forgetting that they have to, to build a disabled toilet and then add it at the end. It's part of the design. And it's, that's not seen as a massive constraint. It's just part of what it is. It's common sense or, if you like, it's progress. Um, and that's commonly accepted, widely accepted nowadays. Why should we have to accept the fact that access, media access, or audiovisual translation, I just added at the end, um, late, for very little money, and with no contact whatsoever with the people who have made the product, with the architects that have actually built um, uh, this audiovisual kind of product. I don't think that makes sense at all. And this is something that we can, we should and, and can change by first raising awareness about amongst filmmakers about how much what they are producing will be changed on, or manipulated or impacted upon by certain types of translation or, or media access um, so that they can understand that it's in their interest to actually have a discussion, to have a meeting, to have a collaboration with the translators. I don't mean that the translators have to translate collaboratively with the filmmaker. I mean that it's only common sense that they should be in touch with the filmmaker and it's only in their interest actually because as a translator or as somebody who provides media access you may have very legitimate questions about what to do with what you're doing uh, with the product that you're translating or making accessible and you're taking an undue amount of responsibility by making certain decisions that will affect the very nature of the product that you're translating. And this is something that should be part of a conversation with filmmakers. So this, what I'm saying is, is nothing new. It has happened before, it's been forgotten, um, and it's happening again. Uh, so this initiative called um, Accessible Filmmaking is now kind of taking shape in terms of research, training, and practice. And there are many filmmakers who are um, now realizing that um, 
they can't just let go of their product um, and then not know what happens when it's received by an audience that may be the biggest part of their audience um, in many ways because we're talking about foreign audiences and audiences with sensory disabilities, with learning disabilities. So it's in their interest and I think we're moving towards that but we need a, we need a massive push from different kind of uh, sides. So academia, the industry, um, of course regulators, the audience. I think we're getting there but, but it's, I, that's how I see uh, the future for us. I mean I think we, should, we, should, we will become more visible. Um, and having said that, there's also one more aspect that's important in that which is we're not just talking filmmakers here, we're talking anybody who produces media. So in your case, for example, you're, you're making this video so even though it's all about accessibility, you are being a producer. Um, you're producing media and you're making it accessible. So, uh, and that's something that could be done by anybody with a phone, a tripod, um, and access to the internet. So if we're doing that, and all the more reason, of course, all the more true, if we're doing that with a view to um, spreading the word about accessibility, then have we thought about how we frame um, the people we're interviewing? Have we thought about um, how, how we go about the camera movements? Are we making... Um, product that is fully accessible. Uh, if I start moving my hands like this, am I going to be covering subtitles? Is this a problem? Is this an issue? Um, there's so many aspects that are just not being taken into account. And it's not just Spielberg who should be um, told about this because I don't think he'll will reach him. But there's many independent filmmakers who could be thinking about this. And of course, there's many people who just produce media as we all do every day. So I think this should be an essential part of the training received by anybody who produces any audiovisual media. Um, and I don't think it is, um, what's the word for this? A utopia. I think it's just common sense. So it, it's just, at the moment, it's just not common sense. And in the future, it will be seen as an obvious thing, I think. So it's just part of uh, progress and hopefully we'll, we'll get there. Hola, Romero Fresco. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Pleasure.